Okay. So yeah, so we are live now. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm Marine Van Schoenbeck. I'm the general director and co-founder of Thanks for Nothing. I'm very happy to see you all tonight for this uh, live conversation as part of the Art and Social Commitment Symposium 2021. So as some of you may know, our organization um, did decide to organize this symposium and this is the fourth edition. We organized it to support the younger and, and create awareness among the uh, younger generation and to coordinate different voices of artists and um, activists throughout the globe. So this year, the symposium started on Monday at the Louvre Museum with mostly French and European speakers, as you can imagine. So we wanted to remain international and to create this conversation. So we decided to have it online. And for those who participated in these sessions, on Tuesday, we were very happy to have Liz Johnson Arthur uh, which, who is a wonderful photographer in conversation with Christian Gresh from the museum in Boston. Uh, the conversation was moderated with Jessica Nusenbaum, who is here today as well. On Wednesday, we had a conversation between Mami Kataoka, the director of the Mori Museum in Tokyo, with Aska Gauthier, who is part of the project at Thanks for Nothing. And today, I'm very happy to welcome all our guests, uh, especially for the first session, Shadi and Uma Nahuni, who will be uh, in conversations with Jessica as well. And for the second panel with Eric Gutesman and Claudia Peña as for Freedoms Organization. And we are very happy to have them. Uh, Vincent Ponce also from Harvard Business School is joining us and will highlight uh, the way uh, political institution work in the US and how he also changed the way to um, participate in his class and political classes at Harvard. And so it's a great conversation between all of them. And so um, I just want to add a few words before uh, welcome you all and, and leading and leaving uh, Jessica to lead the conversation. Just to tell you that this symposium this year is very important to, to us because we created the symposium as the starting point of an entire art and social commitment here in Paris. Uh, what happens is that we organize two parcours and two programs in Paris. The first one is a program uh, in more than 25 galleries in the eight arrondissements of Paris, like Gaussian, Kamel Menour, Perrotin, Nathalie Obadia, and many other um, important galleries here. Uh, all these galleries welcome so schools and students and beneficiary of NGOs throughout the week. And the second parcours is an invitation that we did to Oliver Beer, who is a very important British artist represented by the Galerie Tadeusz Ropak here uh, in Paris and of course internationally. And he presented at the Opéra Garnier uh, a work that he created at, at the Opéra de Ciné in 2018 and now is reactivated within the walls of the Opéra Garnier in Paris. And throughout this week, we are very happy that more than a thousand people and young people actually registered for this parcours and we welcome them every day with our team in the galleries and at the Opéra Garnier, which is a wonderful way to get connected again with the art scene here in Paris and to make it accessible to new audiences. And, uh, and tonight, we're gonna also discuss these topics we are with our guests, and this is why I'm so happy to have you all and to remain all connected, even, even in this very complicated time that we face. So again, thank you so much to all of you for being here. And thank you so much to Jessica, who was the initiator of this panel and who coordinates uh, everything with us. So Jessica, this is to you, and thank you again so much. Thank you, Marine. Thank you so much. So for the Art and Social Commitment Colloquium, we've gathered um, tonight or this morning two wonderful people, Shadi Ahuni and Uman Ahuni. Today, we're going to hear about their work on memory, speak about the unspeakable, 
politics, but also hear about very noble approaches to art and teaching. Um, and we can see some slides also later on in the panel. Um, they're going to give us an art perspective more focused on the Middle East and specifically about Iran. Both Shadia Numan are born and lived in Iran. They moved in their teens to California in LA and now live respectively in New York and Boston where I actually used to live until a few weeks ago and I just relocated to London. Just to give you a little bit of background, Uma Nahuni is a practice-based theorist of culture and education. His work combines psychology, philosophy, and political economy and addresses the potential of institutions for maintaining or changing social relations. His study of power dynamics in culture <clears throat> opens to conclusions that are actually very relevant and interesting for education, but also for leadership, organizational studies, and social theory. Shadi Ahouni is a visual artist based in New York and Tehran. Her practice ranges from site-specific interventions and sculptures to printmaking, photography, and film as well. Her research is centered on marginalized histories of dissent and resistance, mostly in the Middle East. Shadi is also a professor um, and head of undergraduate studies in the Department of Art at New York University, NYU. Just a few housekeeping notes. You can write your questions in the chat box and We'll address them with pleasure at the end of this talk. Uh, so for the first theme, actually, Uman and Shadi, or when we were speaking with Shadi a few days ago, they came up with it. It's addressing the unspeakable. So Shadi, there's a, a paradox. Uh, speak about what you cannot speak about. Can you explain that to us? Hi, hi to everyone. And thank you to your Jessica, Marine for the lovely introductions. Um, how to do that? Um, Human, you and I share some history, some familial history. Uh, you have given us the bios uh, so wonderfully. Uh, to that, I can add that we are also siblings. Uh, that we will not leave unspoken here, but I'm wondering maybe you can help me in um, considering what we are going to leave hidden or unspoken in this context. I'm thinking of um, I'm thinking of the image of dad in prison and uh, especially when he was in solitary and uh, there was just this one window for a couple of months that that was his only it was the only place where color would come in the only thing that would change was that was that window mom leaving uh, at 2021 20, with a suitcase running away from her from her parents uh, to go study social relations. We're going to have to leave that out too. What else hmm. do we have? Maybe um, the smell of metal and labor and sweat on, on dad's shirt and the line of workers and creditors that would go through our apartment that I imagine you and I experienced differently. Uh, the grandpa in the village, I think. The smell of cow shit. Family of 12 children, at some point two wives at the same time in a Kurdish village that is no longer a village, but a grand city of sorts. And Definitely not going to talk about the Jewish, uh, the Jewish site, right? Definitely not. Yeah.
and also that period where we were both uh, where we both died in Los Angeles. You mean the the sheer pain and the shit that is immigration? Yeah, definitely not. Yeah, as teenagers, I think that's a good one not to talk about. I mean, we. <laughs> this is sort of the problem. This is what a lot of my students, you know, do. They come. Um, they come to the classes, and you know, I, I, I teach education, and they have these markers: uh, immigrant, political activist, etc. And they begin to speak from that. They say, as a as a person of color, as a woman, as a man, as a, um, and they just they make it clear in the beginning that what they really want me to do is to give them more tools to speak as a as an immigrant as a i don't know if you have that so much in an art school i think inevitably we do um also as artists as um and educators we often end up falling into that ourselves the markers are there and there is um, there's a market for the markers as well. And, and, you know, the, and a place of solidarity. So if I say I'm an immigrant and then you say you're an immigrant, um, then we don't have to get into, you know, the difference between you and me here. And we can we can go from there. We can start from the solidarity instead of you know the the sheer difference. I mean, we you know we kind of look alike. We have the we're wearing the same stuff apparently today. Um, but then the the pressure is to really just talk about that to talk about and then give the slogans so that we can make sure that we're all committed to the same thing instead of uh, going to the edges and to the differences. That's that pressure is also there. Um, so, you know, Jess, you were asked, you were in this idea of the speakable and unspeakable is very present in my work because people come to me in order to um, hear very often as clearly as they can the lines of social commitment. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to be committed to. Um, this is how we're going to be the same. These are the slogans that we're going to have. And this is the line of action that we're going to follow. And the hardest my, part of my job is to disappoint them um, and to, to allow them to, to find the freedom beyond their battle for freedom. Um, and it's not a pleasant job, I think. I mean, we can enjoy it a little bit, but but it's not it's not very nice in the beginning because they're very they're very very I'm taking away uh, their reason for being with me and therefore rendering myself useless as I do that. Thanks, Uman. And so this may seem very abstract, but um, do you feel maybe art or in your case more education um, can reveal, but also like create these conditions for discussion, or I know you have a very specific way of starting your, your classes at Harvard. It sort of looks like an arena. And then people mentioned that they come out after a few months completely changed and all their um, notions or prejudices, everything has been shattered after attending your class. Maybe if there's part of the Francophone audience um, that's listening to us, um, can you explain maybe those differences or how you do that or because I know you're very much you stand back or you from your students and you let them you study also case studies to, to let them speak amongst, amongst themselves. I mean I get involved pretty hev heavily because uh, it looks like I'm not talking but you, you know, usually the class uh, starts with me declaring uh, how much I get paid to teach the class. Um, and then telling uh, 
telling the students to, you know, a title of the course might be something like power and pedagogy, or it might be identity and politics, uh, something of that sort. But what nobody is there initially to talk about is the conditions that we find ourselves in. So kind of like, you know, the, the panel uh, right now, I think is very comforting now that I'm speaking. Um, and answering questions kind of clearly. Um, but it becomes very uncomfortable if we start shedding light on, you know, kind of a direct light on what is happening between us. You know, like try to get, find out what's happening with Claudia Pena, she, her, uh, in that corner of the screen. Um, or the way we are talking or my tone of voice or, you know, your tone of voice. So telling people how you get, uh, how much you get paid is tantamount in that situation to um, either you know either stripping naked they think you either have stripped naked or they think you have entered with a clown suit and they wait for the next act which they expect to come from you and at that moment if you fall silent then you can really see uh, what um, they can really see what the um, what their expectations were of the teacher, of the clown, of the striptease artist. Um, you can get you can get into that, and it uh, you know I'm hoping it has implications beyond that, beyond that moment. But Shadi, you're soft. You 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 hold them. You hold your students a lot. Uh, I believe the word you were trying to get to was softer, and I wonder if that is the case actually. Um, I think the striptease is, is a wonderful metaphor um, for what is often expected of art and artists. Um, this going back to uh, Jessica, your question of, uh, of revealing art and education being in um, doing the work of revealing, whether that is really the case. Um, I think that in, in the work that I do both with students and in my own practice, I'm often working with what is hidden. This is true. Uh, working with artists, young artists who are also trying to, to understand their own practice. You're always working with what is hidden. Uh, and uh, I think there is um, the paradigms in which we work tell us to drag what is hidden out into the light. And, and there's value in that. There's value in the kind of brutality of that. Uh, but also doing the work of trying to create conditions where what has been dragged into the light can actually move back into silence, into, um, uh, into this realm of the invisible. That seems to be uh, what weighs on us as artists and, and educators. Um, so that, I think, leading ourselves, our students in that process um, ca can also be quite harsh and unsettling. There's something very unsettling about it. And um, Shadi, to, I know that you travel back and forth to Iran. Can you tell us what is it like to work in the field? in Iran with the, the people that address their history, like you were mentioning your own in a very touching way at the beginning um, of the panel? Um, There's a complex situation. On the one hand, the markers that we were mentioning at the beginning are can be extremely helpful uh, to be a woman, to be a uh, uh, empathetic, but also to a large extent on the outside. These are things that that help when I am working specifically in Iran uh, with individuals, with communities. Uh, there, the possibility of, of trust and empathy being built seems to, to exist kind of through these markers that are almost immediately recognized. Um, I work mainly in, in quarries and factories uh, generally spaces that are set up for a kind of extraction, 
But of course, what becomes extremely clear every time that uh, that I go there is that there is there's no way that you can extract simply extract. So time has a funny function, um, as it does in all things, and and so does productivity. Uh, it has never happened that there is an idea, there's a project, and you go and and suddenly it, it, it manifests itself. Uh, the acknowledgement that um, there may be no value at all in what I am doing or in what the people whom, uh, with whom I'm working are, are doing is, is very central to this. As there's a lot of waiting um, and there's a, a the possibility of failure is, is real failure, not, not small, but, but real failure is, uh, is ever present. Um, and so a project may that could have taken a day may take four years and, uh, and another that seems to need all the time in the world to develop may come together in a moment. Um, I think that relationship with time also is something that human you play with a lot in your work in running the classroom but maybe that's something that we can also address failure <laughs> definitely we're not going to talk about the fact that we can't go back to iran right now right we're, we're leaving that at... it's the unspoken unspeakable yes yeah uh i mean it would totally it would totally pervert the whole thing the idea that uh, uh, it, it would take away it will sound kind of poignant if we really go into it but it will take away the real poignant stuff which is in the morning um waking up and checking the iranian news before you check you know you check the american news that's that's something that can't be that i can't say it but it can't be communicated more importantly iranian twitter well, the jokes are really good and that's a that's you know that's another thing about you know working i think one of the things that uh, we can't show in this work of um, as soon as social commitment comes comes along uh, uh, or the seriousness of the art world with its uh, you know people dressed in black and uh, uh, the galleries and you know, crap like that you you can't you can't laugh anymore and that's one of the things about you in those quarries you know it's you and your team usually spending basically most of your time laughing uh, because at any moment things are going to are going to really fail they have already failed you know you're very often you're at the quarry filming failure and oh. that's the i remember the first time you came to any of my classes Usually my classes end and my team and I retreat and there is somebody's crying, somebody from the team is crying or like some serious philosophical thing has come up and we discuss that and really think what are we going to do next. Since there's no syllabus, everything is decided in the moment. So it's a very, it's a grand moment of philosophizing and uh, deciding pedagogy. And then the very first time you came to one of my classes, you know, in my maturity, when it was over and we had had that meeting, you and I went home and we laughed our asses off at what had happened for the first, it was kind of like a first where I could laugh. Everybody else was so serious. Um, everybody else, you know, thinks you need to have the, you have the, you know, you need to have the solutions or you need to have the right ideas because in the future, everything is supposed to, you know, you're all, it's all preparation for victory in the future. And there is, doesn't, it, they, there doesn't want to be an acknowledgement that a lot of what you're doing is actually reliving the failures of the past, um, re-entering them, knowing very well what's going to happen. With all the nostalgia and hope that comes with it. Yeah. And the, you know, the feeling that, oh, we're going to have a real conversation today. We're really going to figure this out today. For example, the students are feeling what you know, I'm, I'm hoping. And then you know that uh, already that that is doomed, that somebody's going to mention race in America and people are going to feel very uncomfortable and start going at each other's uh, 
uh, throat for reasons they don't understand, or somebody's going to talk about suffering and you, people are going to start measuring their sufferings against each other. Um, someone's going to say, we need a revolution. In, you know, there's always somebody you know, who, who, who uh, wants to either sanctify that word or uh, misuse it. Uh, and some, you know, somebody else is going to laugh and say, what does that mean? And people don't want to say that we are on, we're walking on the grounds of failed revolutions, failed elections, failed communications. And we're entering them again, hoping that something will emerge that, that has not, nothing in the conditions, uh, the existing conditions allow it, allow for, for it. Uh, and so the sense of humor, kind of, you know, without that, the sense of humor kind of goes out. It's amazing to me that I had to wait for all of that time, you know, for, for somebody of my own blood to come uh, and live with me through it. I do remember staying up all night and laughing. This I do remember. And it is true that also in my own practice, um, teaching or otherwise, um, what I have found to be an achievement, if there's really an achievement, has been to tap into that humor that was always behind the scenes, that was always part of the work, going back to your question, Jessica, of working in the field. That it was more about standing around laughing than um, preparing or moving towards something. And um, when, since you mentioned um, America, and I know Shadi was saying the other day, in the US, anything goes, you can speak your mind on anything and everything. And in a sense, there's a lot of freedom. Um, I want to ask you, how is it also to, to censor and hold back? Or do sometimes do you think that just because you can say anything, do you think people should hold back a little? Shah, do you want to take this? It's interesting that I, I may have said that as, um, as what is readily accepted. It's also interesting that uh, I spent yesterday, most of yesterday with my students and in every studio visit, uh, I heard over and over again, I am afraid of doing this. I'm afraid of saying this. I'm afraid of how it will be taken. Uh, and I won't say it for that reason. Um, I, I work very much in, uh, in that space of, um, of those who have uh, who have been silenced or continue to be silenced or, or lights that have been ordered to go out in a sense or language that is uh, maybe not dead but dormant just beneath the surface um, i think it's uh, the acknowledgement that uh, that is actually a part of how we uh, make art think about art more than art, even maybe education, um, is very central to, to my approach. Um, though the question being is how significant is it to hold back, I think is a question that has a lot to do with time. The idea is, um, you know, we have a dial, especially as artists, that we can turn up or down in terms of how things come together over time. Uh, it, it's a speed dial in a sense. So that's something that I'm thinking about in relation to the question. Um, I'm not sure. On the one hand, I, I work with censorship, very plain, uh, absurdist, funny generally, deeply difficult and painful, but always funny um, in its logic. But then I see it also and experience it every day, especially in arts and academia, especially now. But it is unacknowledged. It's not as funny. 
in a sense for that reason. Hamid, um, our friend uh, uh, who's a filmmaker working in Iran, <coughs> called me a few days ago. And the, the government had uh, said he spent two years writing the screenplay. And the government said uh, to him, there's no way you're going to make this. We're not going to give you a permit to, you know, to make a film of this because there is a there is a woman staying at the home of two two men, and she's not married to to either of them. And uh, you know, and you know, he's, he he said that's the whole film, that's the story, that's the synopsis of the film. That you have a problem. It's just like, well, maybe if she marries one one of them, maybe if she marries one of them, it's going to be all right. And he was destroyed. He was really thinking about that quitting filmmaking. This is a guy who has won, you know, major awards. He's he has launched an entire movement in Iranian cinema. And now he, he really was thinking quit about quitting in, to go through it. But his solution to all that was to say, call me and see if I would like to play some video games with him. And, <laughs> and you know, if, if, if I would like keep him awake until five in the morning, his time uh, to, to go through it. I feel like I'm always telling you, Shadi, about space and you're telling me about time. I've been telling you for a long time to, you know, get out of Iran. You know, don't, you know, come, you know, come, come to the, come to the U.S. more. Um, uh, work, work with these Americans, work with that, uh, with that element of with what is lost and what is uh, what is grieved and uh, what is what is not spoken in America, which is very, very difficult because, you know, since everything goes, there is always a corner, there's always somebody in some corner who has covered uh, what you're going to cover. And then I think you're always telling me about time. Uh, you know, you're always telling me to be aware that this is a particular uh, period that, for example, we laugh a lot because we're part of uh, a generation that follows a certain failure, certain a grand failure uh, of the revolution. That a couple of generations before us, one generation before us, people were actually fighting, and they, you know, it was life and death, and life sentences, and uh, you know, solitary, solitary cells, um, and that in our generation. It has become, you know, it, it looks more like academia and, uh, you know, classrooms and uh, safe spaces um, uh, and, and, and things like that. And therefore, you know, we are a little bit, uh, we both have we need to laugh more and we have less to laugh about. Um, and that maybe a good deal of our work is about the creation of another generation uh, that won't be like us. Um, uh, a different dream. And that's, by the way, is something that is very difficult to convey in the work of education. Um, most of my students might say that they want a generation to follow that's going to be free and empowered. Um, but very often what they mean initially when they come in by that is that they want a generation that understands precisely what we understand um, and can make that live in, in you know in some way and it's it's it's, it's a terrible vision it's, it's terrible for me to tell them that what they want is you know is uh, is terrible and it's terrible for me to tell them um, that that they need that they you know they need to give up that they need to maybe look for something new that's where art comes in that's the one space i can you know when i stand in front of them you know as they're having this conversation and i tell them a hasidic story or i tell them a sufi story or i uh, read a poem or i sing instead of you know talking it's a way of opening that uh, that moment you know dream dream something different than than the slogans you read on twitter or in New York Times, or what your professor told you. I remember this exhibition. Okay, so yes, I was trying to share my screen and 
sorry, Uman, but I'm going to bring us back to Iran, I guess, and so we can see the unspoken. <laughs> um, if you're OK, well, both of you can comment on it. And I guess sharing this artwork. Uh, so the first one that we're seeing here is the Sunken Garden, which are framed uh, sea prints, Shadi, from your work. And I can read the, your text. So the, the text reads, um, clandestine it's clandestine documentation of graves of dissidents executed and buried by one regime and paved over by another following the 1979 Islamic Revolution of Iran. For 40 years, the gravestones have been pushing through, cracking the cement and revealing what lies beneath. I guess Shadi or Uman, can you tell us your interpretation of uh, facts, like being silent, what we've been talking about, yet always finding a way to, to push through? Mm. I, um, Jessica, I actually deeply um, detest looking at this work still myself. Uh, it's very difficult work for me. Uh, for one thing, it is it is a difficult subject, but um, if we were to go look closer, uh, I think uh, I'm never really certain what it is that I have done, what it is that I am looking at here what narrative, what histories I've conjured. Uh, the forms are so obstinate, so silent, that I'm not always sure that it is, in fact, uh, something else that lies beneath these, these shapes. And then, of course, there are little clues here and there. And um, if we can maybe look at another image, little bits of stone peering out little words, names, slogans um, of uh, leftist movements. And some become more clear in this sense. I think I'm really going back to what Human was saying about the generations experiencing um, history in different ways. There is uh, this idea that, that, that time has passed, that um, objects and histories and lives have been paved over. Uh, and for a lot of us looking at them and through them for a, a new generation, it's more based on an, a feeling, an inkling, a hunch that these histories are there, that they linger there. And uh, while I have a very uh, friendly relationship with fiction, I find that in the work that I do, I'm always in the space of uh, of fiction and maybe historical accuracy. But then, of course, there are still flowers that are left on these amorphous forms, uh, whether it's because those who are left behind have uh, a map that's embedded in their minds or, or that they're just happy to leave flowers on the graves of their loved ones' comrades. I mean, I could, I could say in an interpretation of that, that uh, there's some version of me that's buried uh, in there, and there is some version of me that has laid the flowers on, the, uh, on those graves. But the problem with these kinds of uh, declarations is that uh, it, again, uh, limits the limits the possibility. I can say it, but I, you know, I, I say it so that we escape. You know, we we hear it and then we discard it. And there's something wonderful about you know in this era of everybody being super explicit and uh, uh, corporations releasing uh, statements on their commitment to social justice. Um, yeah, I bet you the Louvre has a you know has has a nice long statement. Uh, uh, there is something nice about statements that are clear, that have clarity, but at the same time don't allow you to dwell on them. Kind of like you know those graves. I'm not saying, and that's what's that's what's disturbing about them. They're very nice. They're very beautiful. They're places that you want to uh, linger on or stay with or dwell in. 
very difficult also to convey this, you know, by the way, to, to Americans. I think maybe, you know, maybe in France, there's still something from 1960, you know, from, uh, from 69 generation or the rebellions of 69. There's something from the commune that one can recognize. Uh, in America, it's very difficult to tell somebody, you know, here I was buried. Here I laid flowers on myself. This one is good. This is this is basically you know people laughing at you, Shadi. This like there's the, the little bit the video that appears smaller there is basically people laughing at you as you're digging digging the mountain. Uh, of my work is people laughing at me. Yes, someone was saying we're all wearing black, very black, speaking about grave and like maybe somber things, but it's true that um, this this next video is actually quite funny. Um, and like you were mentioning before, uh, I can understand how you would go home or even after this video. Um, it's just quite funny, like the man looking at you. I mean, if you want, we can just um, explain to the audience maybe like for the title. So is I dream the mountain is still whole, which is a video. It's a little bit over 17 minutes, but here we have some still life, uh, some images of it. And so maybe just to explain again, your text, it says that the film traces the history of Iranian Marxist revolutionaries who barred from continuing their work as intellectuals have taken refuge in the isolated mountain quarries of Kurdistan, um, among other spaces of harsh labor that you were mentioning. And my question was more like when you think of the Iranian plateau, like me or perhaps other people listening in when you have never traveled there and you situate it sort of like between the Arabian and the Indian plates um, surrounded by mountains. Um, in the film, you're, you're digging into, um, into the, the mountain, rocks are falling. Um, it's difficult, it's actually a little bit disturbing also to, to watch and you turn your back to the camera. Um, but it, it's true that it's quite funny because these men are thinking, should we go and help this woman? What's going on? Is it like a documentary? They say it's for television or something in America. And then they speak about like pop songs and they speak about J-Lo and popular culture. It's just really out of context. Uh, it's quite funny, but I was wondering, what are you trying to keep? Or are you carving to, to be remembered? Um, or what are you searching for in, in those mountains? Um, there's certainly a lot of carving that's happening uh, on everyone's behalf, um, in a sense. You know, I first went into these quarries um, uh, at a very, uh, at a time of great tensions um, in the country across the border. Um, ISIS was on a rise and constantly on, on television, on satellite television, and um, there were sanctions imposed uh, by many countries, including the US and Iran. And so I walked into a place where everything feels futile. It's a space that has housed uh, in many ways all of these mountains. Um, dissidents, people who have been pushed out of their work uh, as intellectuals, as teachers, um, who have been pushed into these very, very harsh environments. But what became extremely clear, people have social commitment, if I may uh, use the theme of our uh, colloquium here. Um, what became very clear as soon as we arrived was that uh, there wasn't much to do. The work continued, I was working in some way, but every gesture, every movement, uh, every bit of this mountain that was constantly carved also felt like a very futile gesture. It was already, uh, the quarry had already failed. Uh, whatever mission was there had already failed. The, uh, and so I'm not sure that I'm carving and looking for something. There isn't much of a search in there. It, it was my gestures were 
uh, the most readily available futile gestures that that we could take on. Uh, we also ended up uh, playing a nice game of football at the heart of the mountain. I think there I was a lot more useful because I, I chase after the ball. Um, but but it's it's really that it's um, being in that space and and taking on exactly what it is that's happening all around you. And those guys who are laughing are savvy. They're not. Uh, they know what's going. They know the score. They know. They know the relationship between Jennifer Lopez and this a lot more clearly than uh, uh, than I think. Uh, viewers at a gallery in uh, in Manhattan uh, uh, would be able to conceptualize. They know the absurdity of it, the funniness of it. Uh, they have some conception of this difference between what is being done here as you know in the name of art and uh, what is happening in the name of work and then what's happening around them in the name of politics. So if they're laughing, they're not, um, they're not innocent um, in that environment. That's our friends, uh, uh, our friends' hands. Uh, that you know, it's uh, I've, I've, I've once a, once every few uh, weeks we have to check on check on him to make sure that uh, he has survived, whether it's uh, you know his third battle with Corona or his you know. 300th battle with addiction or anything that that might be um, and those are the hands of someone who probably wrote the most beautiful uh, poem uh, of our generation of Iranians um, and, and he's there just to say that those hands at that moment were deeply hung over and they had just spent a night uh, for reasons I do not understand in a cemetery before they arrived on set. And so, uh, Uman, since you were mentioning um, the people and the viewers of the Manhattan galleries and versus the people also on, on the quarries in, in Kurdistan, um, I know you, you wrote a very interesting article about Jean Berger of like bringing the arts to the people and the unpretentious unpre way he has. Um, I don't know if he's so famous in, in Europe or maybe more. Can you tell us a little bit about, about that? God, I should have read the article uh, before, before I came. That was written during a few, there was a, there was a period where all I was doing was writing obituaries uh, of people uh, that I, that I was uh, that I was losing, and John Berger was one of the people that that I had lost. Um, so you know, the, Berger was uh, it was was incredible because he was generally considered one of the most uh, influential writers on art um, and social commitment uh, in the English speaking world. He had some cachet. In, in France, he lived in France for most of his life uh, and wrote very well in French. Um, but at the same time, he couldn't walk into a single art gallery. He had no connections. He couldn't get his, you know, his friends uh, situated in a gallery or, or even a museum uh, if he wanted to. And he had a way of writing about art, which was to at the same time be a child. And he was very much like a child, even at the age, you know, especially at the age of 90. Um, and at the same time to be the socially committed um, theorist. And at the same time to write from the perspective of the dead, to be, to be with the dead. And because he could do that, uh, you know, as I was saying all of these things, I was looking at this image um, that's in front of me of to, to try to read it from the perspective of the child. People don't know, but you know, in where, where we are, so 
in this space, the Zoom space that we are, there is there are other people that you can't see because you can only see the speakers. And one of them, you know, is going to come on. Just wrote, you know, said, did he ever drop that rock? Did your friend ever, you know, drop that rock afterwards? And uh, yes, uh, in you know, in fact, he did. And that's the that's the view, you know, of the child that actually makes this gives this the 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 real shape of it because you have to look at it from the perspective of the child to understand that this is about heaviness. Um, this is about holding something or being cut off. And then you need the theorist to read, you know, um, what is happening, what the relationship between that and the text underneath it. And you need to have the perspective of the dead to, to find its, its it's meaning beyond uh, beyond meaning. It's uh, to find the thing in it that that lasts, that makes you want to carry carry this uh, with you. We never talk about the dead, but to, you know, to, this afternoon we really have it, guys. We're we're doing it. Shadi, do you want to comment on the, this next piece, the Mossade? Or I can also read your text. I mean, I know actually that Uman thinks it's uh, too pop. That's like being privy of like some other conversations, I guess, <laughs> in Boston. But I personally like it a lot. Um, so the story goes, Reza Nik was a shoemaker in Hamadan. A few days after the revolution, he changed the name of his little shop to Mossadegh, the name of the first elected prime minister of Iran deposed in a CIA coup. He installed a neon sign with the name, four connected letters that in Farsi reads as MSDQ. In a month or so, the new authorities ordered him to change the name. He had the first letter taken out, and now the shop was called Set, which means truth. After a few years, the light in the S went out too. His shop's new name was Deck, which means death by heartbreak. He let this new title stand. Um, so it is very heartbreaking indeed and is it fatality or what did you mean um i think if we go to the next image we might also have the text which is the title of the work with it um Der, death by heartbreak is uh is something that that is quite familiar to us for many reasons i think this for me going back to your original question perhaps your first or second question, Jessica, around uh, uh, how do you say and not say? He, he has said nothing at all. Uh, in fact, he has been ordered to be even more silent. But there's something for me in, uh, in this very deeply personal, intimate, most private refusal of, of the man and the light that refuses to go out and still flickers, even when ordered to be silent in this way. Um, it's also funny. Why is Uman uh, laughing? Um, well, first of all, it's very funny. I also, I'm thinking about, you know, where we hear the word death uh, most often it's you know I'm a mother who's in the uh, who might be in the audience uh, tonight uh, is you know she she very often says you're giving me death by heartbreak <laughs> especially when Shadi decided to go into the arts uh, and I into education you know it's not kind of worked out like this piece for you know. Uh, this going into art and education like this this piece kind of worked out people keep buying it. Um, you know, which says that, uh, you know, I'm so glad I'm not your business advisor or any kind of advisor, Shadi, because I, I you know, I, I, I argued against it. 
I argued against it because this is really close to the original story. Like this, this one, this one really happened. And um, Shadi extracted it from reality um, and gave it a certain kind of um, uh, continuation. This would have been a story that I think other than Shadi, maybe only one other person would know. And with the, with the passing of that person, it would have been forgotten. Um, so at, you know, at first I was against it because I thought it's going to, it's too close to reality. Um, but I had forgotten, I think, that um, I had forgotten, I had taken reality for a slogan. I thought I knew what reality was uh, when I said that. And I think the reception of the work is kind of reminding me that maybe I don't, I, maybe I don't, maybe I'm not as intimate with the facts as I thought I was. I'm also very happy. Oh, this one is, uh, this one is uh, excellent. Um, it's, a, it's an Iranian toilet. You're speaking about passing. <laughs> the two last pieces are actually here, yes, still about a grave and the next one, uh, cemetery as well. But um, so this one is the grave of the Sufi um, in Kermansha. Um, and so this work actually made me think of um, the work of uh, Barry Zakari, who speaks a lot about citizenship and um, Sufi. But I was just wondering, are some, are some works spit out and some of them are swallowed, Shadi, and I think we're we're almost running out of time. I think we are certainly running out of time, which is a wonderful part of everything that we do. Um, and and so I will let these works stand as they are, perhaps with the text. And uh, I'm so looking forward to um, hearing our fellow. Um, humans who are on this call and and maybe we can come back to them too and this was not the toilet then the persian toilet this was i really i really messed that one up didn't i go back and look at my work again yeah <laughs> um do you want to comment on this one or hi Hi Jessica. Hi everyone. Um, I just think maybe we can we can have one last uh, conversation on this, and then if you if this is fine with all of you, we can switch to the four freedom. But of course, um, Uman and Tadi, you can you can stay with us and we can you know interact. But it's just that the four freedom team cannot stay for more than thirty minutes after that. Um. Yeah, I guess we can we can actually take questions um, from from the audience, and uh, well, one last point actually is, um, Uman, as you mentioned uh, previously before the recording, you you don't vote, you have never voted, and you have decided to never vote. So, um, all this for personal reasons, and this is the perfect transition to our next panel which is uh, how we can increase voter participation and how arts can help with that. So perhaps um, Claudia and Eric and Vincent can convince you, but if not, I'll let Marine tell us if there are any questions. I need to clarify. It's not that I will never vote or uh, I, have never vo I, I have never voted. I've never voted in an American presidential election. Um, and that was because I didn't have the candidates. Um, I didn't know any of the candidates, so you know maybe I knew them too well. But if if there is an if there is an election where I have a candidate, I really do vote. You know, so local elections, for example, I find I find very important. Um, but I, you know, there is a there is a large portion of, for example, this American society that does not vote and they're in fact the winner of every election uh, and we don't want to acknowledge them well, you know I, I don't think they're stupid 
I think they're holding out. Um, and it's all right for a portion of the intelligentsia to hold out with them and work on the creation of, work actively on the creation of the candidates or the, or the, or the parties that they can vote for, that they will vote for. So I, no, I believe, I, I believe so much in voting. I find it so sacred and important that um, sometimes I have to, sometimes I have to vote by not voting. I think it's less that people are holding out and more that the state, the United States, as such a young country that has caused so much harm to vulnerable communities for centuries, the state insisted on people not voting and insisted on um, folks not being able to have the opportunity or the power to engage civically, um, Black folks, women, Indigenous people, etc. So that message for generations was what people received, and it's a very brand new um, concept that people actually have the access to voting. And even then in the United States, as we all know, with voter suppression, as gross as it is, people still don't really even have the power to vote properly. So I, I think it's less about holding out and any like form of intellectualization and more a response to, you know, the lack of invitation for a long time. Eric, were you gonna say something? I was gonna say something, but I was gonna say something else, which is, and I know Claudia, you're gonna join with me in this, um, but I was wondering because Human and Shadi, you, you spoke so eloquently and it was wonderful to hear you speak. And a lot of what you spoke about had a lot of pain in it, <clears throat> but you also spoke a lot about laughter, but I didn't see you guys laughing at all. Um, so I was wondering, because voting really and civic engagement as we talk about it is about participating. So I was wondering if you guys could join me in laughing right now for uh, like 30 seconds, if we could all just laugh. Are you gonna make it laugh? together? No, I, I, I got nothing funny. You gotta make yourself laugh. So let's start. And Vincent, Jessica, Maureen, join in. <laughs> You're insane. <laughs> you gotta bring your kids, Eric. If you bring your kids, everybody will laugh. <laughs> I think I think what's so removed from this yeah, conversation. I think I love this idea. I think it was it was great. It was a great move. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's so what's so what's so hard about this conversation about civic engagement, or even about art or education? I mean, both Claudia and I are teachers as well. Is that it gets rarefied and removed from the body and removed from like our actual lives. Um, part of what we've been doing with Core Freedoms, you know, you talked about Human's slogans and the danger of how we communicate so well. Um, I also think of like um, how slogans can be appropriated. Um, I think about in Buddhist practice and meditation practice where, you know, Pema Chodron talked about um, slogans <clears throat> being a path to awakening in ordinary, ordinary life. Um, and I think like it's tempting to opt out of these things or to kind of like remove them from our bodies or remove them from our, our real lives. Um, but it's also, it's sometimes harder to do things that seem silly or um, earnest or uh, actually, you know, getting out on the streets. I think a lot of what we did in 2020 with, with Four Freedoms, and I'm getting ahead of, the, I'm jumping ahead here because we haven't even introduced ourselves. But I think a lot of what we've been doing is, um, is not the technical work that Vincent does on, on a granular level of actually, or Stacey Abrams or you know, people in the American context that are actually getting people to vote and to the polls, but we're trying to inspire and incite and light a flame for people to do their thing, whatever that thing is. And whether it's defined by current practices, political practices or aesthetic practices or yeah. not. Yeah, I was thinking about what Human said about general elections, presidential elections. For me, they're the least inspiring of all the elections, but they're also the ones that get the most turnout. Um, so um, folks are sort of very moved by having the opportunity to, to you know, have their voice heard on like the largest scale. But the work that we're doing at Four Freedoms is less about like, find a candidate that you like and go vote for them because political candidates are very 
very, very rarely inspirational on any level. Um, but more so like find in yourself the things that you care about and engage, activate on anything, anything that has to do with like the world around you. And that hopefully that also um, ends up um, to Human's point, uh, encouraging them to participate in smaller elections and um, in smaller ways and more localized ways. And part of how we did that was talking about civic joy. Eric, I don't know if you want to share um, any of our images, but um, you know, civic duty, civic responsibility are usually the way that we talk about civic engagement and voting. And um, you have to vote because so many people died in order to give you the right to vote here in the United States. And though all of that is true, it doesn't speak to everybody. Um, and so we're very interested in the slice of folks who want to um, want to want to be able to participate in a way that feels much more joyful or an expression of creativity, um, being able to use imagination as they engage. Um, and so this is part of why we've been so excited about the Wide Awakes and the Wide Awakes movement. All what you're looking at right now is in time in Times Square on Wide Awakes Day, 2020, October 3rd, which was sort of a day of jubilee around civic engagement and voter participation. And this was the initiation <laughs> of the first Wide Awakes. And as you can see, the the images that are used, um, there is some consistency between all of them because we very much open sourced the assets and ensuring that people can iterate upon the things that were created and make it their own. And we were really searching through throughout American history for examples of this and, and global history. I mean, certainly in the Middle East, in, in um, different parts of, of even the United States, there, there are histories that precede our current political context that, um, that suggest that other political mechanisms are possible. Um, we found a small group of uh, uh, self-proclaimed abolitionists in the 1860s called the Wide Awakes uh, that used these, these kinds of uh, iconography and signs um, to protect dangerous points of view. And they held marches, you know, public marches and, and marched down the street in Broadway on, on October 3rd. Uh, which is coming up in a few days. It will be the first official national holiday of Wide Awakes Day. Um, this is only part of what we do. And I know Jessica was, was going to show some of the billboard um, images that we've done. But you know, part of this Wide Awakes thing was open sourcing culture and figuring out ways and vehicles that and prompts that we gave out, I guess, as maybe there's there's definitely a pedagogical aspect to it but it's also like you know we're just inviting people it's an open invitation to participate and redefine and and um get in where they fit in and in some cases that meant people took boats and made flags and some people in some cases it meant they made artworks or capes like the capes of the original wide awakes in 1860 um you know and 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 overlaid with the complexities of the year of 2020, um, it, it, um, it, it took on new meaning as it kind of accumulated. So it was really us putting these ideas out there and seeing, seeing where they led. Which is, which is weird because like, you know, in political practice, like it seems like that's not, I mean, Vincent, maybe you can speak to this more, but like, it seems like that's not something that is um, considered to be effective or um, an efficient use of. Yes, yes, and uh, I was very interested in seeing the type of um, actions and, and happenings that you guys have been organizing. Also, uh, looking at some of the billboards that you have been uh, that you have been using, um, and I think you know the I do a lot of research on uh, the issue that uh, Claudia was uh, talking about, which is uh, low engagement of voters, low participation. It's true that sometimes uh, it's difficult to find a candidate that we're excited about, but the issue with low participation is that sometimes it also means unequal participation. And then you end up with a president who doesn't represent uh, the voices uh, of the people. 
And so in my research, I spend a lot of time trying to understand why there is such low participation in the US today, which is a bit puzzling. Uh, you know, what's exactly the cause? Because it's not only low, but it's also been declining for a long time. And I think one cause that uh, sometimes, you know, we think, oh, it's because people are not interested, etc. But I think there's another cause also, which is that it's often very costly to buy. Participate in the US, especially, and I, I don't talk about the financial cost. It used to be the case that you had to be rich to participate. Fortunately, that's no longer the case, but uh, you do need to go to the polls. You need to register uh, before the polls. If you have moved, you need to register again. Uh, so someone who moves, a young student, for instance, who has moved away from their parents' place, has to do two things before election day, uh, registering again and, and then voting. Um, and I think there's another cause, which is decreased trust, decreased trust in uh, politicians, in the institutions, but also decreased interpersonal trust. Uh, it's quite remarkable that uh, in the US, and I think that's the main second problem beyond just low participation, is this polarization that we observe uh, in the US society and uh, major distrust. There are interesting questions that have been asked to people for a long time, for instance, how would you react if uh, your daughter was to marry um, a guy who is on the other side? Of the political spectrum and you know in the 60s 70s people said fine with me i don't really care or I'm, perhaps i'm not so interested in politics whatever but in, in any case i wouldn't like uh, take a feat because uh, of her decision to do this and today the vast majority of respondents both on the republican and on the democrat side say yeah that would be kind of an issue i, I would really feel uneasy uh, about uh, welcoming someone from the other party in my family. Um, and so I think democracy has become an, exas an exercise to count the strengths of two opposite sides, which are increasingly distant uh, from each other. But in my view, democracy should, shouldn't just be about counting strengths. It should also be about deliberation. It should be about the transformation of people's preferences. It should be, there should be a possibility for me to talk to you and uh, to get convinced and to end up with a different point of view than the one I had before. For. And so the, the question is, what can remedy these issues of low participation and of uh, polarization in American democracy? Uh, and so I, I found what you're doing very interesting in that respect. Um, let me say why. I think first, it's an effort that is independent from political parties. So the, the, you're not endorsed by the Democratic Party or by the Republican Party. And this can perhaps facilitate bridging the gap between politics and people who are estranged from politics, who stop voting, who are disgusted by politics. The second thing is that I, I, I suspect that um, your initiatives can help people take a step back from day-to-day -day politics to go back to the big questions. And I think that's what you were mentioning, Claudia and Eric, you know, people asking themselves, why do I engage? Uh, let's, if I reflect beyond just who the candidates are, why is it important for me to engage in politics, perhaps to go on vote? And the third thing is that many Many of these billboards that I that I saw, uh, and, and just on taking a step back from day-to-day -day politics, I think the, the, the fact that you're using some imagery that was created in 1860 is. Uh, just an example of that, like you're inviting people to also go back a bit to the history of uh, um, uh, voting rights that were not respected, uh, the enfranchisement process, etc. And so, yeah, my, my third point is that um, these billboards, I suspect, can generate discussions. Many of these billboards, many of the actions that you do are puzzling. They are sometimes a bit provocative. And so they are here for people to engage and uh, to uh, uh, to also have discussions, hopefully, with people that perhaps are very different from them, perhaps have a different viewpoint, but still are citizens of the same country, and uh, they might still learn something and teach something uh, to these other people. I have looked at other actions in my work, but I think some of um, the type of campaigns that I've been involved with and that I've um, uh, evaluated have uh, something that is quite similar to what you're exploring, which is um, that they put discussions at the forefront. Um, and in particular, there has been a renewal since the early 2000s in American democracy of doing more door-to-door -door canvassing. And I see this as very positive. There's evidence that it increases participation, but I see this as particularly positive because it's a way for volunteers to bridge the gap 
between parties and official politics, in a, in a sense, on one side, and on the other side, uh, the population. And the reason for that is volunteers have a foot in both worlds. Oftentimes, they belong to the neighborhood that they canvass, but they are also uh, members or close uh, to a particular party. And through door-to-door -door canvassing, uh, you can have a number of discussions between people who don't know each other. I've done you know, door-to-door -door canvassing in France and the US. I suspect people were surprised to see a guy with a French accent knocking on their door uh, in New Hampshire before uh, election day. But this made for extremely rich uh, discussions. And I have tried to use that also in my own teaching at HBS, where we use case studies and where I invite students from all the parts of the world to share views, to try to persuade each other. Uh, and, and to have discussions. And I've al always also told them that ideally the discussion should continue outside of the classroom uh, because even if these HBS students come from many places, they also are not fully representative of the American population. And so it, it's, uh, it would be amazing uh, for the discussions that we have to continue uh, with other types of people. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all that piece. I feel like you just made all of our work sound so much smarter. Because <laughs> that's essentially what we're trying to do. Um, what, just really quick before we jump into the images. Um, at Four Freedoms, we consider ourselves anti-partisan. Not bipartisan or not nonpartisan, but specifically anti-partisan. Because we feel like that opens up conversations a lot more. Um, Jessica, you can start moving through the slides, I think. And Eric, you want to jump I in? I mean, I think, you know, the way in which you classify yourself, that's the type of things that invites a discussion. Uh, you know, we could, now I, I would, <laughs> I'm, I'm puzzled and I, I would like to like push you and to understand why exactly do you use this word, et cetera. So that's an example of what I was mentioning that, you know, I think the types of actions that you do invite uh, discussions. They don't leave you yeah. indifferent. Right. Yeah. And it's, and, and it's, it's, we would love to be pushed by you, Vincent, and 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 and, uh, and like being open to that kind of criticism and and experimenting with language and being willing to fail. I mean, like um, Shadi and Haman were talking about failure. I mean, I think that that's that is a um, a practice that uh, we we as artists are willing to kind of bring into our work. Now, um, like when we talk to real life political people, not people like us that are performing the act of being political operatives. Um, they, you know, they're like, yeah, but I mean, maybe putting up a provocative billboard in North Carolina, for instance, is not a great idea because people are not looking to be persuaded, like because of exactly what you're saying, um, Vincent. I mean, like, so whereas what we are, what we we are thinking within the metaphor and symbol, you know, symbolic um, value of putting a billboard with certain uh, images in certain places, um, even when it might fail if judged by the political efficacy of the act of putting a billboard in that specific place. And so the story that we are telling is about putting that billboard in that place. You know what I mean? Rather than, I mean, there will also be people who see it, but I'm, I'm, and I'm interested. You, met, you probably have information about this, Vincent. Um, you know, if 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 people are unwilling to let their children marry people of the other persuasion, then are they really open to receiving messages and being persuaded? I mean, it is is that the basis of persuasion, the basis of democracy? It it, it seems to be on the idea that I could persuade you of, a, of an idea and you might vote in my direction, right? But if that- I, I think idea, so, yes, I yeah. think so. But I think this won't happen uh, if there are many intermediates between those people. And, you know, I, I've done some research showing, for instance, that if you're a Democrat, it's increasingly likely that most or all of your neighborhood of your neighbors are Democrats. So the people you interact with are Democrats. If you're Republicans, the same. Increasingly, we live, you know, we, we talk about the bubbles that exist on, on social media, but we live in real bubbles where uh, even in the last 10 years, the fraction of Democratic neighbors of Democrat citizens has increased a lot. And so 
I think we end up with misrepresentation of people on the other side. It's very easy to diabolize uh, people on the other side to have a very image, a very bad image of them if you never really have an occasion to simply talk to them. Um, and there's some research that shows that with door to door canvassing, you can in fact have this type of uh, uh, discussions that otherwise would be difficult you know perhaps mm. i would never watch fox news or perhaps these other voter would never watch uh, cnn but they might be willing to engage with someone on their doorstep and uh, um, there's a, a researcher at the university of berkeley david brookman who has partnered with organizations for instance lgbt organizations or organizations that defend the rights of immigrants and he has found that uh, um, if uh, LGBT people uh, go and knock on doors uh, and talk to uh, people who are perhaps uh, very intolerant uh, to begin with, then they can actually manage to persuade because they say, look, I'm a human being like you. Like you. I'm just coming on your door and I'm you know, just uh, having a discussion about my experience of being discriminated against, etc. And uh, uh, he and colleagues have found long lasting effects of these discussions. And I think it's only because they take in person and because uh, as human beings, we're able to empathize, we're able to understand where someone comes from if we are having a discussion with them. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I, Eric, I just want to make sure we said something about this billboard before it moves on. You want to say something about it? Uh, you can talk about it. You can you talk about it. Well, what's interesting about this image is it um, it's from the Edmund Pettus Bridge in um, in the southern part of the United States, and it's an old photograph. John Lewis, who um, recently passed last year, a civil rights leader of the United States, is facing down. I think it's the National Guard, but we put the words "Make America Great Again," which has been said by many presidents before Donald Trump ever uttered those words. And what was fascinating about the response of this billboard is that people from every political stripe were mad at us. Everybody was critical. Everybody had, um, you know, some um, some beef <laughs> with this piece that we put up. And so we felt like this was a great success. Yeah, and, and actually the headline of CNN when this was reported on was residents of Mississippi, uh, like, uh, what was the word that they said? It was basically residents of, oh yeah, residents of, of Mississippi unsure of controversial billboards content. And the idea that we could take a, a, you know, a medium of, commu of political communication, which billboards are, and insert ambiguity and nuance into it was really, a, 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 I think, a successful thing. I also think it's important to note that, that this phrase was not only said by presidents, but it was also written uh, in a book by Octavia Butler in the 1980s as the candidate, as the presidential candidate's future slogan in 2024. So, and, you know, the idea that artists are imagining what is to come, and and I loved how um, how Shadi was asked the question, "How much do you hold back?" depends on on time, and really, we're trying to what what often happens in the history of art is that artists you know, say things that seem prophetic or out of touch or something. And then eventually they, some of those ideas make their way into the mainstream. And I think one of the things we're trying to do is reduce that time frame and see what happens when we try to insert critical discourse into public discourse. Claudia, do you want to talk about this billboard? Yeah, I'm trying to figure <laughs> out which angle to talk about it. So this is Hank Willis Thomas's billboard who would be with us, but he just had a baby. Um, who taught you how to love. And part of the reason we were interested in this question in this particular context is that um, just as Vincent was talking about in American politics, things have become so polarized that people actually use the word hate, right? Like there's a lot of sort of hatred for people's ideas, maybe even for people's political parties and people in general. So one question that became interesting is where are people learning this from? Where do they learn to hate based on political party? <laughs> Where does partisan hate come from? And so who taught you how to love? Okay. Um, that's one, one aspect of the conversation that becomes interesting is where we learn these different emotional responses to the people in our communities. Can you show the next one, Jessica? Just on this, I mean, I think the hate that you mentioned, that is 
that's behind some of the polarization. Um, some of it comes from the elite of both parties. So the, the, there have been uh, studies showing that uh, the polarization oftentimes starts at the elite. If you look, for instance, at the, the speech of the elite, the interventions by congressmen uh, in, in, in the Senate or in the House, uh, you will see a lot of polarization sometimes uh, taking place before uh, then uh, the polarization actually reaches the American citizens. Mm. This one is the Guerrilla Girls and part of what's interesting about the United States is um, we are considered a democracy, but as I mentioned before, with so much voter suppression query whether or not we're a clean sort of democracy. So um, the Guerrilla Girls did this piece to ensure that votes were being counted because it seemed that in many spaces, many jurisdictions, um, that was not happening. Next slide, Jessica. Yeah, and, and I think at the basis of a lot of our work, this is a billboard by Ai Weiwei um, that we put up last year. Um, and I think at the basis of a lot of our work is a willingness to, to um, engage in political discourse and artistic discourse that is uncertain, that ends with a question mark. Um, often, you know, we like to say that artists are always asking questions, even amongst ourselves. I mean, Claudia and I had a disagreement the other day about anti-partisanship. You know, like, is, that, is it possible to be against the idea of partisanship? Or are there actually partisan, you know, uh, like anti-partisanship in the way that we've framed it is that we're not, bipartisan, we are against the idea of partisanship. We, we don't believe that there is partisanship. We don't believe that there's a right and a left. That we don't believe in those binaries that, that are often used to describe. Even as I say that, I know that Claudia is probably thinking, ready to disagree with me on, on some level, and I'm probably ready to disagree with myself. But I think that those, those question marks are the things that are holding back the status quo of of, of existing political systems that continue the exclusion and isolation of, of certain people. Um, so we're, we're really trying to expand the, the imagination of what's possible through being uncomfortable ourselves. I would be more than happy to disagree with you on this <laughs> myself. <laughs> but... I'm, sure you, I'm sure you have very good evidence. <laughs> but uh, the, I, I see parties as something that is some can be useful even though often frustrating in the sense that they help organize a bit the debate uh, and it, they help people uh, to locate themselves on the political uh, axis and to clarify what they think on some issues now i think an issue in the us is that there's really only a two-party system and it's very difficult for new parties to emerge that's a bit due to the um, uh, voting rule you know you just have one vote and uh, it's very difficult for a new party to emerge because even if some people might like that party, they wouldn't want to lose their vote on that party and they prefer to vote for one of the top two candidates who can actually win the election. In other systems that are more proportional, like in Germany, there's more space for new parties to enter or in France with a, a two-vote system. And uh, uh, this, um, yes, allows for... Uh, also new ideas, for instance, environmental ideas have been pushed by green parties much more in European countries than in the US where it has always been difficult for green party uh, to emerge. That's exactly right. It's, it's the fact that it's binaries that is a problem for us, right? The, the binary between Republican and Democrat. If it was a multi-party state, then I think the partisanship may make more sense and be a more useful metric. Can we see the next slide, Jessica? Yeah, sure. Can, can I just ask um, about this one, the Ai Weiwei one? It seems like very forceful. And I know I heard um, Bill Burns, the director of the CIA this summer, saying at a conference that if there was any evidence of China, the implication with the spreading of the virus and this COVID pandemic, the evidence was clearly very well um, erased. And so it's, I mean, one of the first times that I heard someone from the American government saying it in such a clear way. Do you, it, does that have anything to do or do you want to comment about that? Or I don't know when this exactly the billboard. Well, it went up in the fall of 2020. And the answer is, I don't know. Um, and, and part of how we interact with artists is to ask them to put up a billboard. Um, and we don't 
try to shape it to our own design. We're really looking for multiple voices. Um, so Ai Weiwei didn't submit an artist statement with his billboard. Um, we 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 don't have. Yeah, we didn't we didn't ask him to do that, but um, but yeah, but that but I love that interpretation of it as well, Jessica. Before Vincent lives leaves, um, can we hear one last word from him? Yeah, I, I love that billboard. I mean, that's exactly the billboard I had in mind when I said that you have some provocative billboards that uh, generate discussion. Uh, there's the opposition between using your vote, which is a very peaceful form of political expression, and then casting a stone against your oppressor, uh, which is a much less peaceful endeavor, uh, also much more risky. Uh, and so um, I, I think this, this billboard is great because everyone realizes that perhaps they would want to cast a stone, but it would be a, a bad idea, risky uh, mission. And instead, there's another weapon that they have at their disposal, which is using, using their vote. And in fact, perhaps there are very few other ways that they, that they can use to express their voice. So I, I really love that one. And if I saw that, I suppose... I would be yeah engaged in in coming and showing up on election day, so I, I have to leave. But uh, it was so good to uh, meet everyone and meet you, Claudia, Eric, for the the, the discussion. Also, uh, a, you know, a great uh, discussion before with a uh, woman and Shadi. Uh, so uh, I hope we can continue the discussion in some way, um, perhaps ahead of the next elections. Thank you. Great so to much. meet you, Vincent. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Vincent. Bye bye, bye everyone. Oh, this is uh, Anissa Tavangar who works for Four Freedoms' this is billboard. And it actually connects to something Shadi was saying earlier. Um, what do you keep when you go? Um, so there's like the, I think for, and actually I'm not going to speak for Anissa. My interpretation of her piece <laughs> is um, when we move on to the next world, right? When we move on to death from here, um, what is it that we keep, if anything, right? And these discussions around, death um, and what that means for life here. I think that that's, uh, this is a conversation that we're not good at having in the US. I don't know if other countries are better at it, but it's something that I personally would like to normalize more. Claudia, can, can I ask you to also talk about your billboard? Because I think that is a good way to, for us to end. I know we're have to, we'll have to go, um, but I, as as we're moving from our work, from you know, from awakening to justice to healing, I think it might be great to hear from you about those the connection there. I'd be happy to talk about it. I think we did not put it in our presentation though, <laughs> so sorry right. that we can't share it. <laughs> oh yeah, maybe move through them, Jessica, this is, so folks can see um, everything that we'd put together. Um, my billboard, I helped, I'm a, an organizer, a community organizer, and um, as a result of all the Black people being killed by police here in the United States, um, I helped organize a vigil in my little town um, to honor those who had passed on as a result of police brutality. And the vigil was really lovely. It was really beautiful. There were so many people there, especially white people who said that this was their first time ever attending anything like this. Um, and there were people who were elder, you know, like in their 70s and 80s saying how glad they were that our town was doing something for it. And because it was a visual, people brought really beautiful flowers. So we actually had a ton of flowers and I took some photographs. And then um, we sort of zoomed in on those flowers and we put the words, when will you make amends over those words? And when you look at the billboard, it just looks really pretty. Uh, you don't quite know what what to take away from when will you make amends? Amends with who? Me? Who? <laughs> uh, but then if you were able to zoom in, you would see that there is actually um, references to the people who have died as a, as a result of police brutality. And this is a good one to end on. Eric, you want to say something about it? before? This is our, our partner and co-conspirator, Love Over Rules, um, by Hank Willis Thomas. Uh, it's a neon that can get reconfigured in all kinds of, of ways. Um, these are an ethos that that we that Hank lives by and that we we all kind of uh, have incorporated. 
Um, and I think I think that idea of, of uh, when will you make amends, you know, that question um, is implicates each of us personally and individually in terms of our our own um, responsibilities and and duties for care, which I think may be what freedom looks like. Um, and uh, and it's also a, a statement of something, Claudia, that you said at the beginning today, which is um, it's it's not only a personal statement, it's a historical and a national and an international statement. Um, when will we make amends? Uh, and And maybe that does relate very directly to um, when people are going to feel comfortable participating in their democracies or in their in the production of their societies. Right, because that's the only way. As we're for freedoms, we're thinking about justice this year. It's, um, our our theme of the year is another justice by any medium necessary. Um, and justice, of course, as Eric was just mentioning, it requires for there to be balance to put back in place. Right. So when harm is caused by the state, by an institution, by your grandmother, by your neighbor, um, when harm is caused, we have to balance that out and make amends in some way. Um, OK, so I think that that's it. I think we've run out of time, man. Thank you, Sorry, thank Jessica you. and Marie. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Aris. I know I know you have to leave. Uh, so do you want to do you want to comment on? Fine. Give us one last word before you go. Gratitude. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Love Thank you very much. Gratitude. For, That's fine. Thank you for having us. And, and Human and Shadi, it was wonderful to hear you speak. And I hope we get to meet in real life. Indeed. Okay. Thank you so much, Eric. And Claudia, can you stay with us for a minute? Sure. I can stay for a minute. <laughs> okay, wonderful. I was just wondering, since my team um, has a question, uh, Aska and Clarice, do you want to jump in and ask the question that you sent me right now? Uh, hello? We can hear you. You can, okay, you can hear me? Mm -hmm. um, so first, we have a question. Uh, so don't you think that the solutions are in teaching what democracy, the human rights and obligations are in high school level, level in intense teaching, just like gram grammar and math from Francois? I don't know if there are any solutions ever, really, because um, I think everything is sort of a process. But I'll say that, of course, I think all of those concepts should be thought about um, even as a child in family spaces, not just depending on educational systems or middle schools or high schools or whatever. But I think that these are conversations that should be had with your family. My mom taught us a lot about this when we were children. Uh, she was a single mom of four, got pregnant at 16, had four by age 22. And she always incorporated our voices and family decisions around the table. Like, what are we going to do for our Saturday? I'd like to hear from each of you what your opinions are. So at a very early age, we got taught democracy, <laughs> maybe just without that language. Thank you. We did have another question that I guess we can ask to all of you. Is that, is there, because someone was commenting on, on the way everyone was participating to a capitalist society and someone asked, is there an alternative to the capitalist structure of creating political and cultural engaging alternatives? And why mimicking and use the same language and platforms that visual entrepreneur and economic capitalist structure use? I don't know if you have a response to this. I don't think I follow the question. So Huma and Shadi, y'all gotta jump in there. I think the question has to do with the billboards. <laughs> billboards being a being a very sort of capitalist uh, uh, phenomenon of advertising and branding. And then if you, you know, and they're expensive, 
of course, so you have to constantly raise money. Uh, and so why go, why, why participate in that, that structure? That's, that's a question that comes up you know, for me in my, in my teaching uh, all the time. There is the degree that I teach in costs $50, $52,000 a year. Um, Shadis must be pretty similar. And um, therefore, when I tell my students um, how much I get paid, I think that, you know, that's the element of it is to bring awareness to, uh, to, to those conditions. Um, but I don't have a, I don't have a, re, I don't have a clear solution as how to go beyond, uh, beyond those structures and uh, still make a living. Um, yeah, this is where my students jump in and say, we got to burn it all down. And I'm like, well, we got to think about what we want to build. <laughs> in terms of the billboards, um, you know, part of what we're doing is taking up space, taking up public space, spaces that are supposed to be for marketing products. Why not? you know, market ideas, concepts, conversations, market civic engagement. Um, it, Human is right, it is expensive and super temporary, um, but it's a way of being able to reach masses of people, right? Um, we do do work in galleries and museums as well, but that's a completely different um, playing field than being out on a freeway in the middle of Louisville, Kentucky, you know? Um, it's a completely different conversation. Uh, and then just lastly about capitalism in general, there's zero way to make art without engaging, I think, in the marketplace. You have to buy supplies, you have to pay for space. Um, um, there's usually some sort of exchange. I won't say that's universally true because I actually know this artist in Altadena that like only uses used stuff and owns the, you know, like all of these ways in which he's made all these interventions so he doesn't have to engage in capitalism, but overwhelmingly so. Okay, thank you. I don't know, Jessica, if you had a question yourself or otherwise I had a, I have a last one, but go ahead if you want. You're muted. Sorry, <laughs> I was just uh, wondering if Claudia or Shadia Numan had like anything like last words or anything they wanted the audience to remember. And I know lots of students are also listening. But if not, no, that's it. <laughs> sure. Uh, Human, did you, I saw you moving towards, did you want to go first? Oh, no, I was moving in, in kind of, uh, when I have no ideas, I move. You were moving to where you have the direction and um, and the trajectory. I, uh, you know, I think I've I've been thinking in this past hour a great deal and and simply trying to to see how I can look down line um, mass movements from revolution to very intimate uh, even private acts of dissent and resistance. And I'm trying to also trace the same line from the billboard to the vigil, Claudia, as you described it, to the vigil as something that also came up in our conversation to, to the carnival, to a photograph of a line around something that may or may not be rising. Um, it's brought up questions for me and I think um, Perhaps it's, it's, it's a good place to actually dwell in and that in those questions that will remain unspoken. I love that. And so I think my last word is that we have succeeded because <laughs> at Four Freedoms, we think that good art asks questions and encourages others um, to do the same. So thanks, Shadi and Uman. Jessica, Maureen.
I'm I'm thinking about the relationship between these different uh, these different approaches that we. I mean, this this was a very different group of people. Uh, like between Four Freedoms, Vincent, uh, the Harunis, um, the um, and in a very funny way, I think maybe, you know, and I have to acknowledge this, that I think it's become extremely difficult even for us to, to speak earnestly uh, across our lines across the places that we uh, that we occupy. Um, at first I was a little bit surprised like okay we're all you know we're all on the same uh, panel. Um, how is this going to work out? And then as time was passing and I was as I was trying to intervene, um, I understood where, and the, I, I stood that the you know the, that the bringing together of the panel is actually extremely good because it you know it, it, it will bring about a kind of failure that we need to we need to address. Like I need to figure out how to talk to Vincent. You know, he loved that uh, image like at a moment of connection that said, "Would you cast a stone against our oppressor? Will you vote to cast? You know, would your vote cast a stone?" And he said, "We all want to cast a stone." And I immediately my mind went to uh, the words of uh, uh, the words of the New Testament: "Let he who is without sin cast the first stone." And that how controversial that would be as a thing to talk about uh, in light of that, in light of that, and that, and that I don't think any you know most of us would love that. I think four freedoms would love that. Um, uh, but it would be, but it would be a difficult one to really go into uh, as a conversation. So that's what I'm walking away from. I'm going to go figure out a way of talking to Vincent. Okay, that is a that is a great answer. And so maybe um, one last question that can be the last word, and then Claudia, because I can see you that you have to go and we do have, all have to go. But I think it was interesting in, into the chat we had with the, with the audience. Someone asked, and this is also a point that can reunite all of you, um, because we are talking about invisible. We are talking about making things visible also. But there is one question that is, what should remain invisible in our, in our society? Maybe you have an answer to this, the three of you. I really like when Shadi and Human were talking about what's what's going to be left unspoken. And of course, the play in that was that we were getting to hear what was left unspoken. <laughs> um, I'm not sure anything should be left invisible. It's my first thought. I suppose if I had more time to think about it, there might be something. But um, for me, everything should be left outside. Um, everything should be accessible in some way to somebody. You know, um, otherwise it sort of limits limits the possibilities, I think. So my first answer, which I could end up wanting to disagree with myself, as Eric said in a bit, um, is nothing should be invisible, except for maybe like Harry Potter or something. <laughs> okay, Uman, uh, I can see now you have something. There's some stuff that grows uh, very well in the dark, and it needs and it needs the dark to grow. Um, you know, before it can become marketable, before it can, before the market intervenes, before the slogans intervene, before the discussions uh, intervene. Uh, there, I like the idea of uh, certain thoughts, certain groups, certain works growing for a, for a while in the dark until the time is ripe and come, coming out when the time is ripe, like a plant. Um, I have something like that inside me right now. I think most, most people do.
Uman, you and I talk uh, quite often about um, the underground, both uh, in the sense of space and time, as, as, as a space of possibility for growth. You know, if we look at the history of art, uh, just art itself, uh, that those spaces of darkness or spatially really considering something that is underground pushed into walls, mountains. Um, those, are, those are very significant spaces for that kind of growth. We also think about it through time, that there is a, there's an expiration date on the underground. Um, there's also a difference between what grows in, in, in the darkness and the silence in, uh, in the realm of the invisible, including magic, Claudia. Um, also, there, there are those and there's, there are those things that, that stay in those spaces awaiting some kind of justice to bring them back into the light. And, uh, and so the relationship between these two realities is, I think, what we're all working with in one way or another. It's um, to acknowledge it seems to have some value. Uh, to not acknowledge it doesn't change um, its significance. So maybe I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you so much. That was a nice way to end up the conversation with the, the growth of the underground. And uh, I guess this is a great material to, to think about and uh, and yes, and to like the, the way you said, Claudia, to leave also time and shed it because you're insisting on this part of saying, uh, leave also time um, to prepare uh, and to build something else because this is what you mentioned, Claudia. All right, to me, it's it was very interesting. And like you said, Uman, at first, I understand uh, how you would um, question yourself about connecting those, but I think the Four Freedoms uh, project bring a very concrete representation of action and act artist and activist, which to us, especially in France and I would say in Europe, is a real model because, as you may know, um, we do not have this uh, super strong link with, um, you know, land art, if I can address it this way, or public art. It's um, common in France, but it's mostly supported by the state, which also makes it different, as you can imagine. So I think it was very interesting to have this focus on a driven, artist-driven project that you created and that shows um, the you know, broad perspective that you can put on art within uh, public space. Um, so thank you. I love you to participate for your participation today. Jessica, maybe you want to conclude because uh, you reunited this wonderful group of people. And again, I want to thank you for being with us today and for bringing those um, very interesting speakers to us because this is a collaboration we did with Jessica, especially because she was based in the US for such a long time. And so she could also bring light to project uh, that I think our audience is very happy to discover tonight. So Jessica, it's all to you. Sorry, thanks, Marin. Um, no, I think everything has been said. Uh, it's true that um, some people questioned whether like they had anything to do with like this movement or the um, they were unsure of like the mix, but I'm glad that we were able to, to bring down the virtual walls and that in the end, yeah, it, it worked out. And towards the end of this panel, we see that I guess there's a little alchemy or the magic that's been put in place and perhaps the conversations can, can continue. But thank you so much for having us and sorry for going over, but thank you to all. Yes, thank you so much. And as a conclusion, and since people are still watching, I just want to say that the symposium is still going on and that even to you, all of you, Claudia, uh, Shadi and Uman, if you want to join us, on Sunday, we have a Gaga class 
Uh, it's part of a movement created by Ohad Nahin, who is an Israeli dancer and choreographer and probably one of the most important dancer and the best in contemporary dancer in the world. And so we can register and we can dance all together on Sunday. And since Eric was saying that, you know, politics and also um, addressing democracy is about our body, I think it's a very nice way to conclude the symposium on Sunday by dancing all together. So you can register online on our website. And of course, it's free, open to everyone. And uh, it's one of the best uh, dance movement in the world. So really join us if you can. And uh, otherwise, thank you again so much. And uh, good night, good day. And uh, see, see you all soon. Bye.